it really humbles me. Um, just think of the many, many things he's done for me. How about you? <laughs> he is worthy of all glory, honor, praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In uh, John chapter 16, Jesus said this to his disciples. <clears throat> Verse 33, he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Hallelujah. And that's for sure. We have peace in him, do we not? No other name, no other person. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world... You shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus said, you know, living on planet Earth, you're going to have some trouble, all of you. Do you agree with that? <laughs> uh, tribulation means pressure, means trouble, it means anguish, tests, trials, afflictions, and to be burdened. So if we live on this planet, each one of us is going to have some of those things. Amen? But he says, but, but be of good cheer. One of my favorite verses or phrases is, but God. You're reading along, and things are terrible, and things are this and that, and then it says, but God. Hallelujah. But God shall shoot at them suddenly. <laughs> and then it says in the Psalms, you know, that, that pressure, that pressure comes to each one of us, and when it comes, my true character comes out. Your true character comes out. You know, I might think I'm on a certain level with the Lord, and I'm doing pretty good, but when the enemy or whatever, life itself, brings that pressure, then I really see where I am. Amen? And Father's right there to help me. Huh? Amen. Amen, he is. Uh, that brings me to my teaching for tonight. I, I have a one-word title. I just call it Focus. Focus. We must have the correct focus in our life. You know, what, what am I focusing on or who am I focusing on? Uh, it's very, very important to our lives what we, what we have our focus on, what we have first in our life. The word focus itself means a central point of attraction, attention, or activity. A central point of attention, attraction, or activity. Therefore, a focal point. So who or what is your focal point? A fair question. It also means the central or principal point of focus the clear and sharply defined condition of an image completes the, the uh, definition of focus. So, you know, we as Christians, and I'm talking basically to brothers and sisters here, you know, we are either in focus or we're out of focus. Uh, the sad thing is, as many folks, even Christians, focus is faulty. To place our focus on someone or something other than Jesus is to be out of focus. We are out of focus if he is not our main focus. We have blurred vision. We can't see properly. You know, focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ allows us to see everything in our lives in the proper perspective. Our families, our other relationships our jobs, etc., etc., etc. I was sharing with Brother Mark earlier that I have a real good friend that, and we used to, we, didn't, we didn't really disagree, but we would would each give our humble opinion. But uh, you know, he he loved the Lord. He's born again. He's saved. Uh, but he always maintained, you know, but the most important thing in my life, my focus, is my wife and my children. They come first. They come before anything else. Family first. And 
I listened to that, and I said, but, you know, that's not right. What do you mean? What do you mean that's not right? I said, well, that's very good, but your focus should be on the Lord Jesus Christ first. Then your relationship and your perspective with your family, your wife, your children, your aunts and uncles and cousins and everything else will be right. Can you say amen to that? Some people get real upset when you say that, but that is really true. He should be first. If I am focused on him, the rest of my life's going to line up properly. Amen? Hallelujah. It's crazy when we focus on anything else or anyone else than Jesus. Philippians 1 6 reminds us of this being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Father God will complete the work. You know, he hasn't brought us this far and then just dropped and going to drop us. He's not a man that he should lie. You know, he considers you, and I want you to look in the mirror and see yourself. Not somebody else, not, you know, not somebody over here. Somebody, you, personally, he considers you the best part of his creation. That's why he chose you. Now, you still have free will. You don't have to, you don't have to be a son of God. You don't have to be an heir. You don't have to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We get to be if we'll choose to be. Isn't that great? He chose us. It was Father God's choice. You know, he had a plan and a purpose and a destiny for each one of us before the foundation of the world. That's awesome to me. Isn't that awesome to you? I mean, he's, he's magnanimous. I don't, there aren't words that can describe our Father. To think that everybody that ever walked this earth, he had a plan, a purpose, and a destiny for each one of us before the foundation of the world. That's awesome, is it not? You know, he told, he told Jeremiah, he said, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's belly, and I sanctified and ordained you before you came out of your mother's womb to be a prophet to the nations. Hey, that doesn't just apply to Jeremiah. That applies to every one of us that have ever walked on this planet. Thank you, Father God. He's so... He's so wonderful. He's so, you know, it's like I can't comprehend it all. You can't either, but that's okay. Get what you can get and hang on to it, amen? He'll give you more. Keeping Jesus at the center of our focus is our part in having Father complete that work. You know, we are co-laborers with him. He's going to do his part. I need to do my part. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Keeping Jesus at, at the center, at the focus. You know, focusing on his will for my life. Focusing on him. Amen? Oh, thank you, Jesus. I, uh, I read an interesting research study. Uh, it was done by a professor at Northwestern University. And uh, she studied Olympic medalists. You know, we all like it when Olympic time comes around. Well, I do. I like to watch it, you know, skiing and all that kind of good stuff, ice skating. My wife likes the ice skating. Um, but over a period of about six years, she did this study on uh, Olympic medalists, and she found out that the bronze medalists, the guys, the people that came in third, were happier than the people that came in second, the silver medalists. Why do you think that was? She came up with this. She said the silver medalists tended to focus on how close they came to winning the gold medal. So therefore, after a period of time, they were, they were dissatisfied with the silver medal. On the other hand, the ones that came in third, the bronze medalists, focused on how close they came to not getting anything at all. They were happy that they were on that medal stand. Isn't that something? That tells us something about human nature, doesn't it? You stop and think about that. Golly, I came in second, and I'm miserable, and this guy beat this guy, and he's happy as a lark. <laughs> Tells us about something about human nature. 
And you know what that is? Your focus, my brother and my sister, will determine your reality. My focus will determine my reality. You know, how we feel is not uh, determined by objective circumstances. If it were, the silver medalists would have been a lot happier than the uh, bronze medalists, wouldn't they? They had a better, uh, um, they had an objectively better result, did they not? They came in second. But, that, but how we feel is not determined by our objective circumstances. How we feel is determined by our subjective focus. How we feel is not determined by our objective circumstances, but it's determined by our subjective focus. In other words, your attitudes are more important than your circumstances. Inner attitude, my inner attitudes are more important than my external circumstances. Isn't that true? John Milton said it this way, the mind in its own place and in itself can make heaven out of hell a hell out of heaven. Isn't that true? The mind, the mind in its own place and in itself. You know, every one of us on this planet knows someone that can find the good or can focus uh, something good even in the worst circumstances. No matter how bad it gets, they can find something good. And the opposite is true, too. We all know someone who can find something bad to focus on in the best of circumstances. And you know why that is? Because we're humans. Because we tend to focus on what we're looking for. We tend to see what we're looking for, do we not? And looking at it that way, I can break it down, you know, to really, I believe, two kinds of people on the earth. We have complainers. We have worshipers. Basically, basically, we fit in one of those categories. Now, sometimes we, we who are worshipers, I are human, and we have to repent of our complaining, amen? <laughs> Let's make it real. But, you know, we, we, looked at, uh, we looked at Exodus chapter 16 when they came out of Egypt, and we saw how quickly they forgot all the benefits that Father God had given them. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll meet your new need for, for food, remember? But it's going to bring another test. You know, will you obey me? And we found out that complainers always find something to complain about, do they not? We found out that it's very contagious. It starts with one or two, and then if we're not careful, it's the whole bunch, the whole group. You know, because they always find something to complain about. What they got wasn't as much as they wanted. It wasn't what they wanted. But God was very, very generous to them if you remember that story. So on the other hand, on the flip side, worshipers can always find something to praise the Lord Jesus about. Amen? Hallelujah. And he is worthy. Lord, you are worthy, and we praise you tonight. Hallelujah. You know, all of us develop guesses or theories or hypotheses on something all the time. Uh, then what happens, we, we'll look for evidence to prove that we're right, you know, and... and, and, and if there's anything to the contrary, we tend to ignore that, do we not? You know, for example, if you decide uh, you don't like someone, you're going to notice everything that's wrong with that person. And you'll tend to ignore anything that you could potentially like about that person. Isn't that right? Flip side's right, too. If I am head over heels over Edie, I'm only going to tend to see the things that I love about Edie. You know, we tend to see what we're looking for. So you're probably saying, all right, you said complainers and worshipers. What the heck does this have to do with worship? A worshiper makes a pre-decision, a pre-decision to look for something to praise the Lord Jesus about 
even in the worst set of circumstances. It's premeditated. I'm going to praise him no matter what. Hallelujah. That's a worshiper. That's a worshiper. I want you to read with me uh, some guys who had a really, really, really bad day. Really bad set of circumstances. Now, however, the day turned out really well, but for a while, it was the worst of circumstances. Acts chapter 16, it's a very familiar set of scripture, but it's one of my favorite. I love it, and uh, I want to read it with you. Chapter 16 of Acts, starting in verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying, or fortune telling. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were, was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which, we are, which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do, no, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his. Straightway, And when he had brought them into the house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Hallelujah. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privately? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. I like that, fetch us out. And the sergeants told, those, told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Pretty bad day in the beginning, huh? <laughs> you know, I was thinking, I've had some bad days. Can you relate? You've had some bad days. I know you have. <laughs> but you know what? Nothing like this. Nothing like this. Can you imagine being in their shoes? Could you imagine being in Paul and Silas' shoes? You know, it, 
I know we would be um, emotionally, physically, and spiritually spent, would we not? We'd be worn out. We'd be drained. We'd be drained with nothing left to give. You know, here they are. Their backs are bleeding from the beating. They're black and blue from the beating. You know they had to be upset. I I mean, they're human. Uh, Have you ever had a mob form against you? (laughs) We can laugh about it now, chuckle about it now, but my gosh. Uh, And then to top that off, they're thrown into maximum security with their feet in stocks. I don't think it gets much worse than that, do you? I can't imagine it getting much worse than that. It would be a whole lot easier to just stick a gun there, you know, bang, wouldn't it? Doesn't get much worse than that. That's why verse 25 is so amazing to me. It says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining about their circumstances. Hello? (laughs) It doesn't say that, does it? Not at all. It says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. My Lord. (laughs) Beaten, in stocks, in prison. You know, I want to share something with you that I've learned from, from being on this planet for as long as I've been on this planet. If I get into a spiritual or an emotional slump, and I really realize I, we shouldn't, you know, we, we are in Christ, so we should really be this way, but we're all human, and he's still working on us, but we, we have some of this roller coaster stuff, don't we? Yeah, but he's not done with us yet, amen? Hallelujah, hallelujah. So when you, when you are that way, you repent, and you turn and go back toward him, amen? But... Uh, it's usually, when you get in that position, it's usually because you're focusing on something bad. You're focusing uh, on a problem. You're fixated on that one thing. Isn't that true? And most of the times, the solution to that is zooming out to get some perspective and look at the big picture. Isn't that true? This too shall pass. It might be tough right now, but you know what? I've got all eternity to spend with Jesus. Don't you? Uh, I, as I was studying, I, I ran across this letter, and I hope it doesn't offend anybody. It's not the, the uh, purpose of the letter. I found it kind of humorous. My wife chuckled. Um, but uh, a young college student wrote home to her parents, and uh, this is what she wrote. Dear Mom and Dad, I have so much to tell you. Because of the fire in my dorm set off by student riots, I experienced temporary lung damage and had to go to the hospital. While I was there, I fell in love with an orderly, and we have moved in together. I dropped out of school when I found out I was pregnant, and he got fired because of his drinking. So we are going to move to Alaska, where we might get married after the birth of our baby, your loving daughter. I hope that didn't offend any of you. Oh, and then she has P.S. None of this really happened, but I flunked my chemistry exam, and I wanted to keep it in perspective. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. You know, sometimes we need to zoom out and look at the big picture, amen? If you fail a chemistry exam, it's bad, but it's not the end of the world, amen? It certainly is not. So, how do we zoom out? How do we zoom out? How do we see the big picture? And I have a one-word answer, worship. You know, worship is a lifestyle. Maybe I said that wrong. Worship should be a lifestyle. It's not just something we do when we come together on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or whenever we come together. It's not like we come in and we turn it on and we turn it off, is it? No, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. It's taking our eyes off of external circumstances and problems and tests and trials and focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, stop focusing on what's wrong. Stop focusing on the bad circumstances and start focusing on what's right with Him. And everything is right with Him. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory.
to God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, Paul and Silas, can you imagine if they would have zoomed in on their problems that day? Oh, my goodness. You'd have heard stuff like this. God, we cast out a demon, and this is what we get? I mean, that might have been what they said. Or we're on a missionary journey, and we get beaten, and then thrown in jail, and, and our feet put in stocks. You know, they could have complained, and they could have grumbled, but what did they do? They had made a decision prior to worship God in spite of those circumstances. They made that, they, that pre-decision. It doesn't matter what happens, I'm going to worship him. Do you know what focus does? Or, yeah, what, what, what worship does, excuse me. When we focus on worship, it restores your spiritual equilibrium. You don't have so much of this. Huh? Yeah, you gain your equilibrium back. It helps you regain your perspective. It enables you to find something to praise the Lord Jesus Christ about even when everything around you is falling down and going to pieces. Huh? Worshiping is zooming out, as I said, uh, and really refocusing on the big picture. It's refocusing on things like this. You know, 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ gave up everything Everything. He was very God, and he is very God. He gave that all up and took the form of a man and came to this earth and died on a cross for me. I wish I could instill that in everybody on this earth, don't you? We can't do that, but we can be led by the Holy Spirit. And we, we witness and we, we testify whenever he tells us to, amen? But wouldn't that be great? If everybody knew that and everybody believed that and everybody walked that way, hallelujah. He died for me 2,000 years ago on a cross. He didn't have to. He could have called legions of angels. But he told Father God, not my will, but thine be done. Nevertheless. You know, it reminds me of things like God loves me all the time when I least expect it and when I least deserve it. Huh? Huh? We talked about our destiny earlier. You know, he's going to get me where he wants me to go. I just need to do my part and, and cooperate with him, focus on him, be obedient to his will. Amen? He'll get me to where he wants me to be. And you know something? That destiny is the only thing that will ever fulfill us, each one of us. Whatever that destiny is that he had planned for you before the foundation of the world. You know, the world tries everything, sex, money, power, They've tried it all. They're still trying, and nothing fulfills people. The only thing will is doing the will of God. Amen? Focusing on Him. Worship is refocusing on the fundamentals of our faith. Boy, that's for sure, isn't it? You know what happens then? Father God restores the joy of our salvation. Huh? Yes, he does. He restores our spiritual equilibrium. Now, it's not always easy, is it? No, it's not always easy. But I'll say this. One of the purest forms of worship is praising the Lord Jesus Christ even when you don't feel like it, because, uh, not because of, based on your circumstances. You know? Worship is based on the character of our Heavenly Father, is it not? really is. Worship is based on the character of God. Oliver Wendell Holmes said there are two kinds of simplicity. Simplicity on the near side of complexity and simplicity on the far side of complexity. In the same sense, worship, there's worship on the near side of suffering and there's worship on the far side of suffering. Worship on the far side of suffering has greater purity. You know, it is rising above your circumstances. Hallelujah. Worship is reframing our circumstances. There's a book written by a man named Viktor Frankl. The book's name is Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, Frankl is a Holocaust survivor. And he wrote about his experiences in a Nazi uh, concentration camp. And you know, when they took all those people in there, 
They took everything from them. Uh, you know, their clothes, if they had any pictures, anything personal at all was taken from them. And they also took their names. Be aware of that. Frankel's number was 119,104. That's how he was known. Not Victor Frankel anymore, but 119,104. And he said this, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. <laughs> they can't take that away from you. They can't take that away from you. The choice, one's attitude in any given circumstance. You know, I'm absolutely convinced that the most important thing I'll do today is my attitude. Hmm? Really important. Really important. Your attitudes are more important than your circumstances. I write this down. The outcome of your life will be determined by your outlook on life. If you have a critical or complaining spirit, you will complain to the day you die. Your life will get worse and worse. But if you have a worshipful spirit, life gets better and better. Is that not true? You know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, one way or the other, your focus determines your reality. My focus determines my reality. You know, we have free choice. We have free choice. We have the ability to choose and respond any way we want to any set of circumstances. You know, Paul and Silas were in prison. They were in a very, very bad situation. Their bodies were chained. But, there's that one, there's that word again, but. What? But what? Their spirits were soaring. You cannot chain the human spirit. Amen? You can't. And that's what Frankel discovered in that concentration camp. Paul and Silas modeled that 2,000 years ago. Their spirits were chained, but their spirits soared. Glory to God. Glory to God. I think Paul and Silas sang with a conviction that caused their fellow prisoners to listen. And when they praise God at the top of their voices, that choice to worship set off a chain reaction. Albert Einstein said this, You can't solve a problem on the level it was created. In other words, problems created on a human plane are solved in a supernatural plane. Amen? And that's what happens when we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It charges the atmosphere. It changes the atmosphere. You know, for example, you, you can't plan a miracle, can you? No, I can't either. But when you worship the Lord in the worst of circumstances, you never know what he might do. Huh? He's worthy. He's worthy. Worship sets up the stage for miracles. It causes spiritual earthquakes. I like that. I, I thought, you know, we're talking about earthquake here. It was an earthquake and everything fell down. Worship causes spiritual earthquakes that can change the topography of your life, to put it geographically. <laughs> Geologically, I guess, is the word. Uh, it's a shifting. You know, they're always talking about California and everything. The, the tectonic plates are always shifting and it causes, it causes an earthquake and this, that. So that's what it does in our life. Worship shifts the tectonic plates in our life. It might not change the circumstances, though. It might not, but it'll change your life. It'll change you. Amen? Staying positive. Worshiping. You know, it's reality. I wrote this statement. No matter how bad how anything gets, as a follower of Christ, a disciple. You know, he wants followers. We talked about that earlier. Jesus wants us to follow him. His desire is that we follow him and fulfill our destiny in him, not just know him, 
not just call upon him when we need out of trouble, huh? But to be a student, to be a pupil, to be a follower, be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, no matter how bad it gets, as a follower of Christ, we have a bright, bright future. Our future is very, very bright. Yeah, the pain you're suffering now is real, too. But your future in him is real. That reality is going to pass away. The reality of eternity and being with Christ is never going to pass away. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. That reality lasts forever. Can't imagine how long that is. I read a uh, fascinating statistic. Researchers uh, say that the average person talks to himself or herself 50,000 times a day. kind of find that hard to, but that's a lot. And I think since I read that, I, I don't think I've spoken to myself <laughs> near as much because the, the research found uh, results were that, well, how, how much, how what percentage do you think was negative? I'll say it that way. What percentage do you think of self-talk was negative? That's exactly right, 80%. That's what the research found. 80% of self-talk is negative. My Lord. You know, we, Christians, say negative things to ourselves. You know, things like, well, you know, I'm, I'm just not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Well, those guys over there, they, they just don't like me. So we're focusing on the wrong thing, are we not? Huh? We say these negative things, and we let what's wrong keep us from focusing and from worshiping what's right about God. So what's that mean? We're focusing on the wrong reality. Let's agree with what God says about us. Amen? You know, we tend to see what we're looking for. Remember that. A pessimist, he's always going to find something negative. He's always going to find something bad in a good situation. And the opposite is, is true. A pessimist, or an optimist will always see something good in a bad situation. I did share the story with you prior, uh, previously about Brother Busick. He's in heaven with the Lord now. But this would have been 20, 25 years ago. He was in his 80s. And he and some other ministers were going to a meeting, and they're going down the road in a car, and they have a flat tire. You remember this story? And uh, they get out, and one guy's jacking up the car. The other guy starts taking the lug nuts off. And Brother Busick, he's just walking around the car, looking. So, well, praise the Lord. One of the younger ministers said, uh, I've got a question for you. He said, what? He said, why would you say that right now? We, I mean, we have a flat tire. We're going to be late. It's, you know. Brother Busey said, man, it could have been all four. Huh? It could have been all four. He had made a pre-decision, did he not? He's going to praise the Lord no matter what, in all circumstances. He's going to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul gives us some very, very priceless advice in Philippians 4. I know it's familiar, but let me just read it with you. Philippians 4. It's a list of eight premeditative cognitive commitments. Now that's a mouthful. A list of eight premeditated cognitive commitments. This is what he says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. If there's any virtue and excellence, there's anything worthy of praise. Think and weigh and take account of these things. In other words, fix your mind on these things. Fix your mind on these things. I love the Message Bible in these verses. It says, summing it all up, friends, 
I'd say you'll do the best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. A worshiper always finds something to praise the Lord for. Why? Because they're always looking for something to praise him for. Amen? <laughs> it's a premeditated. Worship is a premeditated cognitive commitment based on ultimate reality. Think about this with me. The circumstances you complain about become chain, chains that imprison you. Worship is the way out. Wasn't it worship that set Paul and Silas free physically? It's worship that will set you and me free too emotionally and spiritually. And worship sets off a chain reaction. What happened here? The prison doors flew open. The chains break free. Amen? Now let me ask you a question. Are there circumstances that you've allowed to imprison you? Have your complaints about someone or something become chains? Start focusing on what's right about God. Amen? Find something every day to be grateful for. You know what? That, doing that, it, it, it's a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual discipline. Finding at least one thing every day to praise Him for. Hallelujah. Psalm 103 says this, Praise the Lord and forget not all His benefits. You know, the truth is, you and I are loaded. Loaded, 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 loaded. I don't care how bad it gets, we're loaded with his benefits. What about the words of the, of the hymn? My mother, I can remember my mother saying this when I was a child. She would sing, among other ones. But I can see her and I can hear her singing this right now. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done, my Lord. Then I didn't understand. <laughs> like I understand now. Amen. We truly are loaded daily with his benefits. Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. What about Psalm 116, verse 12? What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits to me? Focus on him. Amen. That's what I can render to the Lord. I can give him all my focus. And you know what? Focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ is a choice. It's a deliberate act of your will, it's a deliberate act of my will, is it not? Let's read Psalm 100 together. Psalm 100, a psalm of praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and, in, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Please remember this. Your focus will determine your reality. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Be blessed.